So thanks for uh, having me here today. I'm a radiation oncologist at the uh, Cancer Center here in Ottawa. Um, I honestly never thought I'd be speaking in front of a bunch of cardiologists in my whole life. So this is a, an interesting uh, uh, part of my early career. So <clears throat> I'm, I basically want to talk to you about a little bit about radiotherapy, why it works, kind of how the workflow goes when uh, Andrew and uh, Callum uh, send me all, all, all their data, how we deliver it, talk to you a little bit about uh, stereotactic radiotherapy, uh, briefly going through the evidence of, of radiotherapy in the, uh, for ca uh, cardiac ablation and potential toxicity. Um, and that, that's kind of an important part is uh, first do no harm. Uh, and uh, given that these patients are very sick, um, we don't want to make them sicker. So what is radiation? So basically, we all rem remember this cartoon from really early grade school. Uh, but basically what we're dealing with is on this end of the spectrum. So very short uh, wavelengths, very high energy, um, and really it's x-rays. So historically, radiotherapy was delivered with using cobalt-60. Um, really, we still use uh, isotopes for uh, delivering for brachytherapy, but for what we're talking about is high energy x-rays uh, using uh, uh, photons. So we know from experience in general, what I do is I treat cancer. I treat lung cancer all the time, sarcoma, derm, uh, derm malignancies. Uh, but we know that we can treat benign conditions as well. So where it's well studied is intracranial uh, lesions such as like an AVM or trigeminal neuralgia. Um, but we, we have treated other things like keloids, um, uh, even warts, things of that nature, although it's a little, little bit more rare that we do it. And the different types of radiotherapy are external beam and brachytherapy. Uh, we do have some crossover with cardiology for using brachytherapy for, before the advent of drug-eluting stents. Uh, again, before my era, but we, we actually have worked with you guys in the past. Um, so this is a, another uh, thing that we're, we're branching out with you guys. So I kind of want to walk through the, the workflow. So after Andrew and Callum get me all the data, we actually sit down um, and we have a diagnostic CT through the Heart Institute. We're actually trying to uh, streamline that now so we don't have to repeat a, a lot of the things we were doing on the first two cases. So it's been a, an, uh, an interesting uh, uh, education experience for me about troubleshooting problems on the fly. So basically we have to use a, a CT uh, scan based on uh, a specific position of the patient. So basically we, we lie the patient flat in our CT scanner. Generally arms have to be up um, because how we deliver the radiotherapy is uh, basically an arc on a, on a single plane. Uh, we can, we can uh, couch kick and that sort of thing and, and change the plane a little bit, but we don't want the arms down by the side because then we're going through the arms for no good reason. So we basically lie them flat. Uh, we put little tattoos on them to, to line them up in the same spot every day. And then we fuse uh, different images. So basically what we fuse here is, is the diagnostic CT scan that Andrew provides, as well as sometimes we, we fuse the PET um, to see where the uh, myocardium is dead. MRI we don't use in this, this case because uh, basically they're not compatible with uh, uh, the CT scan. This was one learning experience I've got. So basically most of the motion, um, believe it or not, is respiratory, uh, respiratory motion. So I treat lung cancers all the time. Some, some lung cancers moves up to three, uh, three centimeters or so. More or less the lower, two, uh, uh, lower uh, ones move more than the, uh, the uh, upper lobe tumors. But we use abdominal compression to reduce the, the, the motion. And what I learned on the first case was my plan was just to fuse Andrew's imaging to our CT scan and then I assume that they, they are going to match perfectly. Interestingly, when we use abdominal compression to reduce the respiratory motion, it really uh, deformed the heart. It, it deformed the heart about, about, about a centimeter and a half actually. So we couldn't use any of the, the data that Andrew gave. So, well, we did, but we, we needed to get uh, basically another CT uh, uh, scan with contrast in our center, which was another learning experience because we didn't do very well. So I thought we did great because I could see the, the four chambers of the heart. I, I sent it to Andrew and he said, well, this is just garbage. So 
What was nice, the collaboration we've had from the Heart Institute, uh, one of your technicians, I don't know if he's here, but uh, worked with our technicians and the next uh, scan we did was, was flawless. It was night and day different. Um, in general, as a radiation oncologist, when I'm treating a lung cancer, it's a white tumor on a black setting, so it's very easy. But with heart, uh, obviously, you need to see all, all the chambers of the, the, the heart. Abdominal compression is, is, is very firm. It's un uncomfortable for the patient, and, um, but absolutely necessary because the more motion that I can reduce, the, the less set of uncertainty I would have. So at the time of the CT scan, we do a 4D CT, which basically uh, at all phases, the resp uh, um, respiratory phase, so it's about nine different phases, and they kind of get blurred into one big image. Um, this image, we basically create uh, something called an internal target volume. So it's basically the scar plus uh, wherever the, the scar could be at any point in time. So just so we're talking the same language, as radiation oncologist, uh, the GTV is something called a growth, so think about it as from an oncology perspective, a gross tumor volume is the cancer itself. A clinical target volume is the cancer plus a microscopic uh, margin around it. The internal target volume is basically a respiratory motion uncertainty. And a planning target volume is an uncertainty based on, on uh, patient setup, because we know they're not gonna be precisely to the millimeter, so we have to have a basically an uncertainty factor on top of everything. So in terms of talking to you guys, the GTV I relate is basically the scar. The ITV is basically the 4D motion of the scar, and the PTV is the ITV plus the setup uncertainty, which is generally about a half a centimeter. So then after we get all these image sets, um, and I work with Callum and uh, Andrew to basically map out exactly where we believe, uh, the scar is plus the, the EP data, uh, I work with my dosimetrist to come up with a safe uh, treatment plan. So basically I'm mapping out exactly where I think the scar is plus the uncertainty margin. And then we come up with uh, reverse planning, just come up with the, the high dose to the, the treatment area and try to avoid uh, organs uh, near the area. So how we deliver the radiotherapy is something called, we call it external beam radiotherapy. Um, basically it's delivered with a linear accelerator. There's different types of linear accelerators. I'll show you an example of um, different types because a, a lot of people uh, believe uh, they want CyberKnife or tomotherapy or that sort of thing. But basically we're using high energy x-rays deliver um, photons to ablate the area that we in question. I internal radiotherapy, brachytherapy isn't really used. So the linear accelerator basically has an electric gun, uh, gun that basically fires photons to, a, uh, or sorry, uh, electrons to a high tungsten target, which, which creates photons and it, it uh, leaves the head of the machine which basically over time, I uh, remember when I was a resident in 2005, uh, we could only treat uh, uh, with a special technique maybe twice, uh, twice a day because it just took so much time. But now basically every plan we do, we either use uh, intensive modular radiotherapy or, or volumetric radiotherapy. Um, you can see on the, the right here, uh, basically in the head of the machine, there's collimators that actually are mobile during the treatment. So they fluctuate in, in and out and basically shape the beam. 30 years ago, what was in the head of the machine was basically big uh, lead uh, plates that would basically shape the, the beam from the head of the machine, but it wasn't dynamic at all. So the different types of radiotherapy, um, if you read the literature on uh, cardiac ablation, a lot of the case reports out there are using robotic radiosurgery, so basically the CyberKnife machine. There's only four CyberKnife machines in Canada. We have one of them. Um, but CyberKnife is very good for very small targets. Um, so anything three centimeters or less, um, it, it's a very valuable tool. So basically it's a big, it's a big robot uh, that comes uh, comes on uh, various uh, different angles, probably up to about 150 uh, different different angles, but it's not a very efficient machine. So it takes about two hours to treat even a single brain metastasis, which is for these patients, uh, to be honest, a lot of my colleagues don't want them in our cancer center very long. So the sooner we can get them in and out is, is a good thing. Um, so 
um, what the cyber knife does is basically uses fiducials, um, so metal seeds to use it as a surrogate for either the tumor or the scar. Again, not very efficient. And based on the size of the targets, we can do the same thing with a linear accelerator. Um, so the St. Louis group that we are collaborating with actually use a, a linear accelerator, which is really the bread and butter of, of uh, the radiation oncology uh, department. So we have 13 of these in our department. Um, but basically the patient lies flat here. The x-ray tubes at the top of the machine here and the collimators here. And this actually treats on a 360 degree axis. Um, so, so dynamically throughout. Um, tomotherapy could be used. It's, it hasn't been used, but basically it's a CT scanner built into a linear accelerator, um, which could have some potential, which I'm, I'm looking at some dosimetric uh, things using either tomotherapy or linear accelerator. Treatment time's a little bit longer for tomotherapy, maybe 20 minutes compared to 15 minutes, um, but it could have some, some value. So going back, um, in general, radiotherapy, uh, historically, conventional radiotherapy is 1.8 gray uh, per fraction up to 2 gray per fraction. Um, so things we normally see for lung cancers or head and neck cancers in the range of 60 to 70 gray, uh, give it daily, uh, weekends and holidays are off. Um, and, and this is a very safe thing to do with, with chemotherapy. However, historically, um, we knew that there is some entities that if you use stereotactic doses, which basically are anywhere in the range of six gray or higher, um, to be honest, the, the definition of a stereotactic dose is based on the Americans and it's anything in five treatments. And that's because they, they get paid more if they do it within five. Um, so we know for malignant brain tumors, uh, either a primary or second tumor, this is highly effective. Um, the doses we are using for a, a solitary brain met, for example, would be 24 gray in a single fraction. So biologically a lot higher dose than the conventional radiotherapy and the convenience is uh, it's in a single fraction and really you have a local control of about 95%. We know we can treat benign lesions, which I alluded to before, but trigeminal neuralgia anywhere from 50 to 70 gray is highly effective if you uh, sever just a a millimeter or two of the nerve. Um, and again, the, the uh, single dose for a, a brain metastasis, depending on the size, 24 gray, downwards of 18 gray in a single treatment. So this, um, for radio surgery, it, it made sense because uh, it was relatively, si it's complex, but it's simple because the skull's a fixed box. So you could reproduce the patient very uh, uniformly because you basically make a shell or some, uh, sometimes a, uh, anything to immobilize their head and based on the distance from the skull you you are very confident of uh, uh, hitting the target so your setup uncertainty that PTV margin I was talking about really was within in, in the range of about a millimeter or so so as technology advanced and we got more ambitious um, we started about 20 years ago with stereotactic body radiotherapy. Um, so this is very common uh, for lung cancers, liver tumors, that sort of thing. And it's become more and more common as we go. So basically the, the principle is very high doses in, in a limited number of fractions. So for example, for lung cancer, um, when we just gave conventional doses of, of radiotherapy of 66 and 33 for a stage one lung cancer, our local control is 15% or so. So really garbage. Um, when we started delivering these high doses of 54 and 3 or 60 and 5, depending on where, where the tumor was, our local control is upwards of 95%. So it's undoubtable that uh, this has revolutionized how radiotherapy is being used in, in terms of, of cancer treatments. I remember I was talking to a colleague, the guy who started doing this, uh, Bob Timmerman Timmer in Indiana, uh, 2006, was basically t told he was being unethical uh, with how he is treating. Now it's a standard of care. So it is re really revolutionizing our, our industry. <laughs> so those findings today. So now we're gonna go to some evidence um, of uh, treating uh, basically animal models. Oh, sorry. Approve? <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, it's mad at me now. Oh, uh, I need help. Oh.
Det, det er sagt. Jo. So then, coming up with the dose for cardiac ablation, it started with animal models. Um, so the first one was, I, I believe, in um, uh, canines. So basically, they're looking using CyberKnife, so different platform, but uh, basically trying to ablate atrial fibrillation. So they basically aimed at the pulmonary vein, um, where the source of the atrial fibrillation was, and they found that anything above 25 grain a single fraction was 100% effective. As they went down, it was less effective. So that's where the dose came up with treating uh, 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 for, for this uh, uh, cardiac ablation. Um, a proton-based approach. Now, we don't have protons in Canada, but th again, this was experimental. But basically, if you ablate the AV node, you can cause complete heart block. And the dose that they found that was effective and safe was 35 gray. So there's some people that when we go to St. Louis and we, we talk, they actually feel that 25 grain in one fraction might not be enough. They feel it might be 30 um, because there is some signals later on that there might be some failures. So. Then the first patient that was treated with uh, ablative uh, technique, basically the same patients we've been treating here all, all along, very unwell, uh, but had no other options. So FDA approved compassionate use only. They use basically CyberKnife using this special program called uh, CyberHeart. And what it showed was the patient was getting very sick um, and the number of uh, VT uh, episodes went through the roof. But almost immediately, as soon as they got the radiotherapy, it almost went down, down to zero. Again, one case report, but very compelling in, in someone that had no other options. So there's other centers that are doing this. As you can see, the platform used is mainly CyberKnife. However, Linac is probably going to take over. Um, and the Washington University uh, data is, is the... Uh, uh, most uh, involved right now. And of, of note, all the other centers are doing non-invasive, or, or invasive, where us and, and Washington are the only ones doing uh, non-invasive uh, mapping. So this was, uh, in 2018, a second publication from the, their, their, the St. Louis group. But basically, again, bottom line is very sick patients. They're using 25 gray in a single fraction using um, basically a linear accelerator. And the primary endpoint was basically for safety, making sure that they weren't hurting anyone, and then uh, quality of life standards afterwards. Of note, this is why I thought linear accelerator was a better way to go. If you can look at, remember those margins I was talking about, the gross tumor uh, target volume plus the planning target volume, really very big targets in our world. 100, cc, uh, 100 cc's on average or a planning target volume is very big in our world. And upward of 300 cc's is, is actually huge. To deliver that with CyberKnife would take three or four hours if you're gonna do um, something like that, where a linear accelerator can treat in 15 or 20 minutes. So what, what toxicities did the St. Louis groups uh, uh, see? So basically how we did define uh, toxicity is acute, which is really within six weeks. Um, and they found that it caused pericarditis in about 5% pa uh, so of patients and pneumonitis in about 10% and basically all settled out with steroids. Um, so very manageable toxicities. Um, we cause pneumonitis uh, probably 5% of the time in our lung cancer patients, so very routine in, in our world. Again, you saw this, the efficacy was, was uh, dramatic. So basically in the six months preceding, almost 1,800 treatments. Um, amazingly, it went down to only about 150 in the first six weeks. So something is going on very quickly. Uh, radiobiologically, we don't know what, what is going on, but we think it's more edema because it's too early to form a scar uh, in, in that time frame. Quality life measures all, all got better, which only made sense if you're not getting shocked as much. Uh, uh, things are better. Actually, the second patient we treated, I was uh, amazed. He, he was a very nervous individual, and I can understand why he had like nine uh, shocks in the previous week, and he, he, he was miserable. So really was an eye-opener to me with tre uh, treating these very sick people. So workflow, again, it, it comes to, uh, the targeting is, is collaborative, but I really depend on Callum and, and Andrew for that. Uh, my job is basically to hit the target. So when it comes to us, um, basically we take all that data, uh, the nice diagnostic CT, the EP data, the PET data, we fuse it all into our, our treatment planning CT scan. And basically where uh, 
I come in is, is really the lining up of the patient on the treatment day. So lung cancer is very easy. It's a big white dot, black surrounding. So it's very easy to hit the target. Here are cone beam CT before we treat. It's, it's not as nice. So you can see the dose fall off is very quick. So what I've outlined is that the treatment target, um, basically the dark red is up towards a 28 gray. Really the D, the D max is almost 33 gray and it falls off very quickly. So the light blue um, is 15 gray. The dark blue is about eight gray. So when I treat palliatively, what I'm trying to think about is uh, what does eight gray mean for a patient? Very simple. When I start doing 11 gray in a single fraction, then I start to worry. and Interestingly, most of uh, the, the two scars we've treated have been at the, uh, uh, the inferior portion of the heart, and you can see the stomach is right next to it. So if we're off by a millimeter or, no, probably three millimeters, our dose fall off goes from, could be 25 gray um, down to 11 gray. So it, it's, it's very quick. When I went to St. Louis this year, um, again, the toxicities, it's very safe treatment acutely. To be honest, they're in and out of the room and treated within 15, 20 minutes. They don't think I did anything to them. Um, but they did report on one of a gastric pericardial fistula. Um, so it happened two and a half years post-treatment. Um, so they've actually changed their dose constraints to the stomach and we're very careful. So if we're off by a few millimeters, that can be very serious to the patient. So that's all I've got. I guess I'll hand it back to Callum. So